do, does anyone, how could a machine really understand the number three? If you understand it one way, you don't understand. If you say three is one and one and one, that doesn't tell you much. But if you say, well, isn't it interesting? Three is one and one and one. It's also one and two, and it's also two and one, and it's also four minus one, and it's seven minus four. Now you're beginning to get something, so you understand more. And if you say three is the number of people when there's uh, two parents and a child, and you could say three is the points of a triangle, which is such and such, and three is uh, this and that. Now you're beginning to understand three. Common man is not very comfortable thinking or analyzing about how he's thinking or that the possibility that he might actually be a deterministic machine or, you know, those things usually bother people. Yeah. It's just that, you know, Minsky somehow freed himself of all these taboos and he can think <laughs> anything he wants. All right. How did he, t how did he free himself? I don't think you ever had them. <laughs> what was extraordinary about Marvin was that he thought he was a robot. He thought we all were. For him, the puzzle of consciousness was that we were robots that were wired up not to realize we were robots. Society of like a democracy where everyone's equal, it's that uh, there are many things that do different things. The brain is very complicated. It has 400 different kinds of computers at least. That is, if you look in a big neurology book, you'll find all these regions and little suggestions of what they each do. It's not one big thing. Well, uh, I think the dominant feature of consciousness is keeping track of what parts of your mind have been doing recently. And I think computers already are better than that. So, according to Marvin, the conscious mind is a society of hundreds of computer programs, all keeping an eye on each other programs running on the neurons in my brain. I think some parts of the brain observe other parts. And here's an example. Suppose that you, uh, I lose my glasses quite often. Everyone who wears glasses loses it. And uh, a smart thing to do is to put it in the same place every time, but I don't. Yeah. So I leave it here and there. Yeah. And so then I go downstairs or somewhere else, and I go back to look. So I'll look in a certain place. It's not there. Then I'll look three other places. And then I'll go back and look in the same place. Yeah. At that point, another part of my brain says, you did that before. You already did that. And the yeah. third time, uh, it gets really alarmed and said, he's in a loop. This is a bug. There's something yeah. wrong with this guy. Yeah. So I think that uh, many parts of your brain are very observant of other parts of your brain and uh, may in fact have ideas about how they work. Yeah. But none of those bubble up to the part of the brain that can talk. Right. And so people, the, <coughs> the verbal, verbal part of your brain knows nothing about the rest of the brain. It's, it's probably more isolated than most of them. So I get the credit while my circuits do all the mundane thinking work. Terrific. But what about the big ideas, my flashes of creative insight? I've uh, for long had this feeling that there's a difference between I think and it occurs to me that. Well, I think that's uh, when people say I just thought of it, they usually mean I just stopped thinking of it. <laughs> it just suddenly occurred to me means that the device that I set up to recognize something that might be a solution has fired. And all of the work for the last few days where the thing has been juggling down, down there deep in the mind, not bothering me. Some parts of your mind are assigned this job, and uh, they don't bother you with reports. They just diligently try tens of thousands of possibilities, maybe it takes a week. Mm -hmm. And then one of these combinations is pretty good. And you say, I, I just thought of this. I thought. Or did it occur to me that the coglot were actually putting some of Marvin's ideas into practice? Uh, so how is your approach here different from Marvin Minsky's? Well, the, the approach is different, but I think we're getting to the same place. Marvin starts up thinking about what it is to be a human and tries to break it down into pieces, the, the pieces that must go together. So, right. But starting in thinking of the whole conscious effect of what it is to be human and then 
breaks down from that the little pieces. What we're doing is starting in terms of the basic reflexes that you get when you're a, a one, you know, a, a zero month old, a one month old, a two month old, right. and how they combine together yeah. Yeah. so that over time it grows into having uh, the same capabilities as this human adult that Marvin starts thinking about. Yeah. And I, I think if you compare our theories, yeah. although Marvin disagrees, but yeah. I think that they come out to look rather similar. So Cog was going to learn and develop just like a child, by doing, seeing and acting. It's got some built-in goals. For instance, one of the goals we'll build in is that once it's able to detect faces, that it wants to keep a face in its field of view. Yeah. So uh, the implication of that is that it should keep someone's attention, because if it doesn't keep their attention, they'll wander off and walk away. Yeah. And so then it will learn from its actions. But how which to entertain them a bit? Uh, hopefully how to entertain them or how to well, keep their attention right. for a little while. Well, that's, well, that's what we're aiming for. Do you foresee such a thing ever being aware of itself? Through this kinesthetic sense of its body, yeah. um, everything that, that happens in the world can be related back to the sensory motor patterns that it feels as it right. makes the observations. Yeah. And, and it, in, in, uh, in, in representing what it sees in the world and how it sees it in terms of its interaction with yeah. the world, yeah. our belief is that that is the same sort of thing that's going on in our heads and that is what our awareness is. So if Cog could see itself and the world and relate what it was doing to the world, maybe it would eventually understand and be aware of what it was doing. And wouldn't that be consciousness? Wouldn't that be the magic qualia of the philosophers? A uh, standard objection to me goes, yeah, but suppose that you had a computer and you attached television cameras to the outside of the computer. And then the television cameras take in signals, yeah. and the signals uh, produce symbols, and those symbols are then shuffled. Uh, magic words used here. There's a transducer, and the mm. transducer converts the electrical energy into the symbols. Okay, now wouldn't that have understanding? Well, it's getting I think towards it. Isn't it? No, it's getting closer. But I like <laughs> to care. Let's carry it through. Let's suppose it's a robot, and it's got yeah. these television cameras, and it clunks around. And let's suppose it's a real big robot. Yeah. And in the robot's cranium, there's a room. And inside that room is, guess who? Me. <laughs> and I'm there with my Chinese symbols. And the television cameras with their transducers produce more Chinese symbols. The point is this. The television camera is only going to give the robot a knowledge of the real world that goes beyond symbols if somebody's conscious of what comes in from the television camera. But the way we set it up, nobody is. In other words, you got to have consciousness. There has to be awareness. There's got to be some sentience or feeling if you're going to be able to go beyond just having meaningless symbols to having some understanding. But, I mean, how about if there's, if there's some other machine that's yeah. observing what's going on? Yeah. Not at this moment connected, yeah. but later to be connected yeah. and so forth. Um, but won't the, the actual, the, um, the complication of it, the complexity of one upon another... A complex get... sequence of zeros is just more zeros. People, I, uh, people think a computer is some kind of magical device. It's not. It's just a hunk of junk that shuffles zeros and ones very rapidly. I mean, several million per you second. The problem, the problem with machines, and when we compare it to us, it seems to me that what they do, they do better. Yeah. And that's, the, that's, yeah. that's what muddles us. Why, why does that worry us? That is to say, all that says is, some people can design an artificial device yeah. that enables me to do something better than I could do it without Well, I mean, device. at the moment we've got one that adds up, for example, yeah, right. better than we better. do. So well, we, right, any, you say, well, we've got the maths. We can, yeah. we can do a bit of maths. These yeah. can do a lot of maths. No, it, strictly speaking, it doesn't do any maths. You see, it enables us to do mathematics. All but right. when I punch in um, 37 <laughs> times 2 and it prints out, what, yeah. 74, yeah. it doesn't know, gosh, the guy right. asked okay. me. Well, it doesn't but know it's, anything. It's, it's, it's just an electrical circuit. It's yeah. just an yeah. electrical circuit that helps me to add. Mm -hmm. Strictly speaking, that pocket calculator doesn't do any ar arithmetical thinking. It just has electrical circuits that I can interpret.
So the difference between me and the pocket calculator was that I didn't just do things. I was aware of doing them. Where did this leave poor old Cog? It's a matter of whether we think it's conscious or not, whether it acts in a way that to us is conscious. I mean, how do I know you're conscious? Uh, yes. you know,